In this video, we'll go over cards which have effects that require them to destroy themselves, or destroy themselves by using their effect, or have a negative effect that causes them to get destroyed. And at number 10, we have Zodiac Barrage. Now, this card has the effect on a face-up continuous spell card, where once per turn you can target one face-up card you control and destroy it, and if you do, you get to special summon any one Zodiac monster from your deck. So, since this card itself is a face-up card on the field, a common way to use this card is just to have it destroy itself in order to special summon a Zodiac monster from your deck. Which allows you to set up a whole bunch of Zodiac plays without using up your normal summon, and makes this card an excellent combo extender, or a combo starter. It was so good in fact, that when they decided to unban Zodiac Dryden, they immediately limited this card to one copy, because it meant non-Zodiac decks would have too easy access to spell speed 2 destruction effects. Now, this card also has another effect, that if it's destroyed by a card effect and sent to the graveyard, you can attach this card from your graveyard to one of your Zodiac XC's monsters as its materials. But that's kind of a niche secondary effect, which is decent too, but the real reason this card sees play is because of its ability to destroy itself to bring out a monster from the deck. Although technically, this card doesn't need to destroy itself, you can also destroy any other card you control to activate its effect which is why it's only the number 10 spot on this list, despite it being a better card than maybe some of the other ones I'm about to talk about. And that's only because this card is commonly used to destroy itself, but it doesn't need to like all the other ones on this list do. And at number 9, we have Odd Eyes Pendulum Dragon. This card has an effect, while in the Pendulum Zone, where you can make it so you don't take battle damage from attacks involving Pendulum Monsters. And also, during your end phase, you can destroy this card in order to add a Pendulum Monster from your deck to your hand, with 1500 or less attack. And since this card came out in the very first wave of Pendulum Monsters, this was basically the go-to Pendulum Searcher until Master Rule 4 kind of killed off the widespread use of Pendulum decks. And since this card destroys itself in order to add a card to your hand, that meant it went to your extra deck. So you could bring it out during your next turn with a Pendulum Summon, assuming you had the scales that allowed you to special summon level 7 monsters. And it had a pretty decent effect on the field, where any battle damage this card inflicted was doubled. Although this card doesn't really see any play in modern Pendulum decks, even though they do still play cards with less than 1500 attack that they like to search out. It's just kind of slow having to wait until the end of your turn to get that search. And there's a lot better Pendulum search cards in the game now, and they can't really special summon as many Pendulum monsters from their extra deck anymore. But it was used a whole bunch before those limitations were added, which is what makes it on this list even if at a low spot. And at number 8, we have Black Rose Dragon. This is a level 7 Synchro monster who has the effect when it's Synchro Summoned, where you can destroy all the cards on the field. Now, this is a good effect. It allows you to destroy all of your opponent's monsters and spell or trap cards. So it's a pretty easy board wipe which can win you the game against certain decks, especially if you use it when you have no cards on your side of the field. However, Black Rose Dragon is a card on the field as well, which means this card destroys itself with its own effect every time, unless you have some way to protect this card with something else. So really, this card rarely actually lives once it uses its effect, and it's almost never used for its other effect, which is just to change defense position monsters to attack position. And this card, which came out alongside some of the first synchro monsters in the game, has seen pretty much consistent play the entire time, and still sees play even to this day. However, there are a lot of really good cards that destroy themselves with their own effects, so those ones just get slightly higher spots than this card, which is also good. It's rare to have a top 10 list where basically all 10 of the cards on the list are pretty good, and they're only marginally better than each other. And at number 7, we have number 39, Utopia. This is probably the most played Xyz monster in the game right now, since it has two really good rank up versions. You can convert any two level 4 monsters into this card, who can then rank up into Utopia the Lightning, which allows you to attack over pretty much anything with less than 5,000 attack. And then there's Utopia Double, where when you bring it out, you can add a double or nothing from your deck to your hand. Then you can special summon Utopia on top of Utopia Double, and then double its attack. And a Utopia brought out with Utopia Double, using double or nothing, can basically attack over anything with 10,000 or less attack, which is pretty much everything in the game. And because it's able to get to such high attack power values, and is involved in both of those combos, as it turns out, having a crap ton of easy, on-demand attack points is still pretty good, even in a game that's kind of completely moved away from the battle phase mechanics, it's one of the most played Xyz monsters in the game. And Utopia has an effect to destroy itself, where if it's targeted for an attack while it has no Xyz materials, it's destroyed. 
Rarely does this effect actually get applied though. It's generally ranked up into Utopia the Lightning, or if you're able to land an attack when it's boosted to 10,000 attack thanks to Utopia Double, it doesn't really stay around long enough for that effect to matter. And at number 6, we have Graph, Malabranche of the Burning Abyss. This card has the effect that if you control a monster that's not a Burning Abyss monster, this card destroys itself on the field. Now technically all Burning Abyss monsters have this effect, so I just chose Graph because it's one of the best main deck ones, as it has the effect where if you control no spell or traps, you can special summon this card from your hand. All main deck Burning Abyss monsters have this effect as well. They also have a secondary effect, which you can use instead of its special summon, where if this card is sent to the graveyard, you can special summon a Burning Abyss monster from your deck. And if you use either of its special summon effects, you can't use the other one. So essentially, it can either special summon itself from your hand, or activate its graveyard effect. But you can't do both on the same turn. And that's kind of how the Burning Abyss monsters are balanced, and why they've been seeing competitive success ever since they came out. It's kind of one of the long-lasting meta decks, which always at least is rogue tier in pretty much every format. That's because each card inherently can special summon itself from the hand, which is always super good. They have really good extra deck monsters, and they all have graveyard effects. Some of them are really good graveyard effects, like Graf, who can special summon a monster from the deck, one of the best effects in the game. And they were supposed to be made fragile by the fact that they don't work with other archetypes and destroy themselves. But you can kind of just work around this with a single fiendish rhino warrior, who prevents them from destroying themselves and also combos well with the Burning Abyss archetype. And at number 5, we have Double Iris Magician. This card has a pendulum effect where you can target a dark spellcaster type monster you control and then double its battle damage that monster inflicts to your opponent this turn. But this card has to destroy itself in order to accomplish this effect. However, this card also has a monster effect where if this card is destroyed, you get to add a pendulum graph card from your deck to your hand. And what do you know? Its pendulum effect that destroys itself just happens to activate its monster effect as well. So you get to search off of destroying this card in order to give you double battle damage for that one card. And the two cards it can search out, Star Pendulum Graph and Time Pendulum Graph, are pretty good, and combo very well with the Pendulum Magician archetype, and allow them to search out more Pendulum Magicians. Basically, this card allows you to search out your searchers while also set up your extra deck with Pendulum Monsters, which was a little bit too good in an archetype that was already pretty good. So the card got banned in order to rein in the consistency of Pendulum Magicians, who all themselves have effects that destroy themselves in order to activate other effects to gain monster effects. Pendulum cards really love to destroy themselves. And at number 4, we have Spiral Resort. This is a field spell card which has three effects. The first one is protection for your spiral cards, in which they cannot be targeted by your opponent's card effects. The second effect is once per turn, just add a spiral monster from your deck to your hand, which is super good. And its last effect is kind of a maintenance cost, where during your end phase you have to shuffle a monster from your graveyard back into your deck, or destroy this card. And here's the thing about Spiral Resort. All three of these effects are good, even the maintenance cost. Spiral Resort is what all other archetypes wish they had as their field spell card, as it offers great protection, searches once per turn instead of just on its activation, and has a maintenance cost that's beneficial to a lot of decks. Spiral decks were one of the few decks that could actually use Brilliant Fusion more than once per duel, as the maintenance cost of Spiral Resort allowed you to reset the combo pieces of Brilliant Fusion, and everyone was already playing three copies of that card in their decks anyway. The maintenance cost is kind of just free recursion, and is great for sending Garnets back into the deck. And since it does have the effect where it destroys itself if you're not able to shuffle monsters back into your deck, it makes it on this list as it technically does have an effect to destroy itself. It's just not really doing so in a beneficial way like half the other cards I've talked about so far. Although it's pretty rare for a card to gain effects off of destroying itself, like Pendulum Monsters do. And at number 3, we have Chicken Game. This is a field spell card which has three effects you can choose from, and also has a passive effect that the player who has the lowest life points doesn't take any damage, which includes battle and effect damage. And this is one of the few field spell cards that has an activatable effect which both players are allowed to use, as the turn player is allowed to pay 1000 life points to choose one of its three effects, which include drawing one card, having your opponent gain 1000 life points, or destroy this card. You can basically pay 1,000 life points in order to destroy this card in the field if you don't want your opponent to have it anymore, or if you don't want your opponent to not take any battle damage with its passive effect. And for some reason, this card also has a Spell Speed 4 clause to its effects, which meant you can't negate them once you activate them. 
Now, this card is currently banned because of its draw one effect, as this card only has a soft once per turn on this effect. So if you just simply played another copy of Chicken Game, you could use its effect to draw another card that turn. And if you played copies of Pseudo Space, which allows you to copy the effects of this card from the graveyard, you could draw a total of six cards in one turn with three Chicken Games and three Pseudo Spaces, which was used in some competitive Exodia decks, and also some other decks that just like to draw cards, which is generally all of them. It was a pretty good draw card, which is why it eventually got banned, especially back when three copies of Terraform were still allowed in your deck. And at number two, we have Mystic Mine. Now, technically, this card is still unlimited as of making this video, and the previous four cards on this list are all in the ban list, with two of them being forbidden. And yet, I still put Mystic Mine above all those others, because this card is really good and will probably get banned in the future. As what this card does is, if your opponent controls more monsters than you do, your opponent can't activate monster effects or declare any attacks which is a super strong lockdown and can shut down a lot of decks, as most meta decks are very monster effect heavy, and even if they're not, it stops them from attacking until this card is gone or they're able to circumvent its effect. As it does have some drawbacks, if you yourself control more monsters than your opponent, you can't activate any monster effects or declare attacks, which means your opponent will be able to do all those things no problem. So if you have a field full of monsters and then activate this card, it doesn't really hinder your opponent at all until you start getting rid of some of your cards. And its final effect, and the reason it's able to be on this list, during the end phase, if both players control the same number of monsters, this card destroys itself. And having zero monsters on the field counts as having the same amount. So if you use this card during your first turn and don't have any monsters in the field, it will just destroy itself before your opponent's turn starts. So you can't cheese this card by not having any monsters. Well, on its own anyway, there are ways to play around this little restriction. You see, there's this card called Metaverse, which is a trap card that allows you to activate a field spell card from your deck. And if you just use Metaverse in order to activate a copy of Mystic Mine as soon as your opponent summons a monster, then the conditions will be fulfilled where your opponent won't be able to use card effects or attack, and you won't need to have a monster on your side of the field in order to keep the lockdown set. Your opponent will have to find some way to get rid of their own monsters if they want Mystic Mine to destroy itself during the end phase, or they have to get some kind of spell or trap card removal in the form of a spell or trap card. And basically, it was because of Mystic Mine that Terraforming a Metaverse got limited to one copy. Because I remember, when Metaverse was first released, people kind of mocked the card as being useless since Terraforming was still at three copies, and there was no real reason to play Metaverse if it was just a worse version of Terraforming. But then they released stronger and stronger field spell cards, and then once Mystic Mine got released, they finally had to rein in the field spell card searches, and now because of Mystic Mind, Metaverse is technically a little bit better. And you know a card is strong if it's affecting other cards in the game being put on the ban list, like in the case of Mystic Mind. And this card is so good that I'm not super confident the number one spot is that much better, but I think it barely beats it out for a few reasons. And at number one, we have Vanity's Emptiness. This card has the effect that while it's on the field, neither player can special summon monsters which on a continuous trap card is super good. If you're able to lock down your opponent out of special summons, you basically win the duel against a majority of meta decks, which is why the ability to lock out special summons is usually only tied to monsters that are kind of hard to bring out. And when they are easy to bring out, generally cards start getting banned, which stop that from happening. And Vanity's Emptiness also has a negative effect to destroy itself, which coincidentally allowed this card to see all kinds of play in all kinds of different decks. Even decks that themselves love to special summon. As if a card is sent from your deck or field to the graveyard while this card is face up, it destroys itself. So this was supposed to be a way to give your opponent an out to the super powerful floodgate, as the ability to just blanket stop your opponent's special summons is incredibly strong. And this card was supposed to be really easy to remove. Although just like in the case of Mystic Mine, most decks are very monster effect heavy, and most of the monster effects that can destroy cards are locked behind being special summoned. So if you use Vanity's Emptiness, there's a good chance your opponent won't be able to get rid of it during their turn. And that's where the negative effect becomes a positive for the player who uses it. They can simply just play a card from their hand like normal, let it go to the graveyard to destroy Vanity's Emptiness in order to play through their turn like normal. Basically, players would just treat Vanity's Emptiness like a one turn lockout, kind of like a dimensional barrier, only better since it locks out all special summons and not just specific types of cards. And since players were able to use its negative effect to their benefit, the card eventually got banned for being too good of a staple, as it was seen playing pretty much every single deck once players found out how to play around its effect. 
There were even some decks that were prevented from getting destroyed by having Macro Cosmos on the field, as if cards are banished, they never get sent to the graveyard in order to activate Vanity's Emptiness effect. And Macro's Cosmos itself was also a really good floodgate, so having both of these cards in conjunction just kind of killed 90% of decks. Although, to be fair, I think Mystic Mind is kind of on the same level as Vanity's Emptiness, and does a better job of stalling out or locking down your opponent longer, but you can't really play Mystic Mind as a splashable floodgate in the way you could play Vanity's Emptiness, so I have to put Vanity's Emptiness a little bit higher on this list, for that reason alone, since its ability to destroy itself was actually a big benefit to the card. Alright, and that's the list. There were a surprising amount of good cards that actually made this list, which I was not expecting when I first got this video suggestion from a comment in a previous video. And like always, if you think I missed any other really good cards that destroy themselves or have ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments. And also, did you know, only 35.2% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel. 